We do not know why we are here. We do not know who built the silo. We do not know why everything outside the silo is as it is. We do not know when it will be safe to go outside. We only know that that day is not this day. The finale of Silo season one opens with the statement, we're being lied to. This is not a revelation. This is just the most recent example in a series of lies that have been unfolding since Juliet started her quest for the truth that's made up most of this first season. What stands out about this moment is that even though Jules will find out that what she thinks she learned from the Jane Carmody cleaning video is wrong, just seeing the video, just knowing that it exists, changes things. It changed things for George, who died rather than give up the hard drive. It changed things for Allison, who volunteered to go out and clean. And it changed things for Holston, who eventually followed his wife outside after he set things in motion for Jules to continue the search for answers as his replacement. If you've read Plato's Allegory of the Cave, this may sound somewhat familiar. If you haven't, the allegory is about the nature of reality and the difficulty of obtaining knowledge about it. It describes a group of prisoners who have lived chained in a cave for as long as they can remember, where all they can see is the wall that's in front of them. They spend their time watching shadows being projected on that wall from their captors passing objects in front of a fire that's out of sight. The shadows become their reality, but obviously are not accurate representations of the real world. The takeaway is that reality is the product of how we perceive the things around us. When we learn new information, that alters our perception, which in turn changes our understanding of reality. At the end of episode 9, Jules was experiencing that alteration of perception. At this point, she believes that Allison was right, and that it's safe to go outside. And her initial reaction is that everyone else in the silo needs to see the video too. When we're introduced to Jules at the beginning of the series, she's a character who has lived most of her adult life motivated by one thing, to keep the generator running. She was hyper-focused, working long hours and extra shifts, all in service of keeping everyone in the silo alive from her perspective. This wasn't the healthiest lifestyle, and it made her kind of abrasive, and when she met George, you got the sense that she wasn't terribly curious about those big mysteries about the silo that consumed him. Him. Fast forward to Sheriff Nichols, who's experienced murder and cover-up, secret surveillance, the existence of the Flame Keepers, the possibilities of drugs in the water supply, the Georgia Travel Guide Relic, the hard drive, the existence of a massive metal door underneath the silo, and a death sentence that was the result of a conspiracy between the most powerful people in her world. It's safe to say things have changed. It makes sense that she would want to get that information out, and that's what she does at the beginning of the finale. They go all the way from level 22 to level 126 in the down deep using the trash chute, because they know that Bernard will eventually figure out where they had the drive plugged in. They do find the booster. There they are able to have the cleaning video play on every screen inside the silo for about 30 seconds before Bernard shuts it down. You only see the reaction of the people in the janitor's closet before Bernard tells them to look away, but they appear to be absolutely mesmerized by what they see. Which stands out because these are people that are supposed to be in the know. And I was really surprised when he told Sims to turn away because the look on his face made it seem likely that he didn't know what he was seeing either. On top of that, Bernard tells the room that what they've seen they will unsee. And I'm not sure if this is related to what Gloria said about the water affecting their memories, or if this is just a threat from Bernard willing them to forget. Another thing that's left open to interpretation is what kind of agreement Sims made with Billings after he outed him for having the syndrome. We know that Paul was experiencing that same change in perception related to his reality after he burned the travel guide relic at the end of the last episode. The raider who had taken his course on the pack that he talked to in Jules' apartment eventually narks him out, but after Sims lays into him, they cut away from the conversation. The next time we see Billings, he's telling his wife that IT and Judicial will make an exception, and in the scene after that, he asks Bernard not to call him Sheriff until it's official. It feels like the character's in limbo. 
as in what he's doing isn't necessarily matching up with what he's thinking, but in a way this reinforces how limited people's options are in this environment. He's one man, and since they know his secrets, they can end him. Right now, he has the choice of going along with whatever they say or following Juliet outside, where she will be going before this episode comes to a close. The chase that started last week does eventually come to an end after a dramatic fall to the bottom of the trash chute in a last-ditch effort to avoid being crushed. Shirley is able to move her to safety in Walker's place, but Knox gives her up to judicial because he knew that if he didn't, everyone in the Down Deep would pay the price. When he bursts into the room, Sims makes it clear that he hasn't forgiven Jules for what happened with his family. This is only a brief exchange that hinges on the fear his son continues to experience, but she does a good job of turning this around on him before they get interrupted. But what's really important here is what Bernard has to say and how that develops the other half of this picture. Jules maintains that people can handle the truth, and it's not just that he disagrees with that, it's that this is the key motivating force behind everything he does. Since that's the case, he offers her a deal in an effort to maintain order. He needs her to stop saying she didn't say that she wanted to go outside and waive her right to a judicial hearing. In return, he won't destroy the lives of everyone she cares about in the down deep. Finding herself in what is a no-win situation, she defaults to the reason she's there in the first place and just asks for answers about what happened to George. Bernard promises that he can do better than tell her if she cooperates. After they leave to march her up the stairs in shackles, Shirley mentions feeling responsible because she's the one who convinced Jules to steal the shitty IT heat tape in the first place. This is something we've been hearing about since episode 2, and this time it gives Walker an idea. She fights through her agoraphobia and makes it out of her apartment for the first time in decades. She goes up the stairs to her ex-wife's place, who we find out works in supply. To go back, when Mayor Johns mentioned the idea of Juliet becoming the next sheriff, Bernard immediately brought up this incident with the heat tape as disqualifying her for the position. It boils down to Jules and Shirley needing heat tape for the generator, and at the time believed they couldn't get their order filled because IT had priority. Jules did her thing and got some, but then found the quality of the tape to be much lower than what they use in mechanical. They wrote it off, but Bernard seemed almost obsessed with the incident, which doesn't really make any sense, or as Walker points out, it doesn't make any sense unless it does. IT's heat tape is designed to fail so that the outside air can get into the cleaner suits. This is a key component of the process because the person needs to have enough time to clean, but not enough time to escape. Bernard was never worried about a couple of rolls of tape. He was worried that people would discover that the suits are built to fail. This is the type of truth that if it got out, it could lead to rebellion. I think it's important to point out that Bernard is a murderer, but as this episode progresses, it becomes fairly clear that he does what he's doing because he believes it's the right thing. It's obvious that this isn't something he came up with on his own, or a classic situation where he just loves to throw his power around. He's either following someone else's orders or some dictate that came directly from the founders. But then it also seems like he might be the only person in the silo that knows the whole story of what's going on. That adds to the perceived importance of his position and the burden that's built into that. And while none of this makes what he's doing okay, you can see why he thinks his role is so crucial for their survival and why he acts the way he does. Later, when he's trying to explain himself to Jules, he tries to appeal to the engineer in her by likening what he does to a form of social engineering. She watched the gauges and made adjustments to make sure the generator didn't blow. He does the same thing with people to make sure the silo doesn't implode. He keeps his word and leads her into the janitor's closet to show her the video of George's last moments. This feels like a chance for her to escape and make a break for the metal door, but it's more about Bernard trying to justify his decisions. In the recording, we see George get away from Doug Trumbull as he's taking him in, and faced with the prospect of torture and having to give up the hard drive, he chooses to take his own life by jumping. This is the answer Jules was looking for, but it doesn't bring her any satisfaction. Instead, it reinforces the idea that they never had a chance and that the silo 
always wins. After they transfer her upstairs, you find out that things are quiet in the silo in the lead up to her cleaning. Despite the video getting out, people are still acting compliant and waiting to see what will happen. Bernard assures Sims that after she's dead, they'll have another discussion about him becoming his shadow, which would potentially introduce him to whatever it is Bernard's up to. Then he has Lucas brought to his office and informs him that since he helped out, he won't have to go out to clean. Instead, he'll be sent to the mines for 10 years. This is a shame because of his natural talent and intellectual curiosity, both of which will go to waste in his new position. Jules is kept in the holding cell where Holston spent his last day, just as Allison did before him. Even though she can see their dead bodies on the screen, she still believes that it's part of the lie, so she doesn't break down completely when her father comes to say goodbye. Shirley delivers a tin of hush puppies with a note from Walker that reads, You wanted the truth. The truth is I love you. Have no fear, they're good in supply, which is something she won't understand until later. Bernard is her final visitor, and he tries the I don't take pleasure in any of this approach that she's not receptive to. The heat tape comes up again when he tells her that that isn't when her trouble started. They started at conception because her parents weren't supposed to have children. This is a detail that wasn't in the book, and something I suspected after watching episode 8. I think it's an interesting addition because it's another way to clarify Bernard's point of view. From the beginning, he would view her existence as a threat to the silo, and the way this all played out would serve to validate those fears. He goes on to tell her that every human life has value, and points out that she had been of great service to the silo before she became a mortal threat to its survival. When she asks about her mother, he shakes his head and says that was her decision to indicate that they didn't kill her. To the end, Jules contends that he knows the display is a lie and she can't understand why he doesn't tell people it's safe to go outside or about the giant door that George found. This is another moment that stands out because you can't tell for certain if he knows about the door. He disregards the first part, but makes a face when she mentions the door before attempting to move on by saying the founders left us with many mysteries. Before he leaves, she tells him she won't clean. He says nobody intends to, but they always do, as the founders in their wisdom knew they would. After they put on her suit, he returns to do the ritual, which is a nice bookend to opening the season with Holston saying the same words. Her walk out is identical to what we've seen before. When she gets outside, she sees the same lush green landscape, but when she notices that the group of birds are in the exact same place as the cleaning video, she repeats the line, the display is a lie. Only now she understands that it's the display inside her helmet. The Founder's plan appears to be to have every cleaner see this as a way to catch them off guard. Perhaps it's intended to pacify them, or overwhelm them, or just make it so they want the people inside to be able to see it too. After living their entire lives seeing the wasteland on the cafeteria screen, the green hills and grass are intoxicating, and from there their actions aren't entirely rational. Something about this experience compels them to clean, and in the book you get a much better picture of what Holston experienced when he went out because you get a beat-by-beat -beat description of his thoughts. He gets so elated because he believes Allison was right and that what he's seeing means that she's still alive somewhere waiting for him. Knowing what she knows, this all affects Jules differently, and as she puts it together, she chooses not to clean and symbolically drops the wool in front of the sensor for everyone to see. This is her way of confirming that everyone inside is getting lied to, and connects back to the idea of pulling the wool over your eyes that I brought up in my episode 1 video. If the wool is a symbol of the way they perceive things through these lies they've been fed their entire lives, when she drops it and starts to walk away, she intends for it to be the catalyst to change the people inside's perception of reality in the same way that hers has been changed. Changed. Initially, Bernard isn't worried because he expects her to die either way, and when everyone sees her trip over a rock, it looks like he's right. She falls in the same area where Allison and Holston started to succumb, and when she reaches out her hand, she sees that the rock in her visor is fake. As he's watching her, Bernard starts to figure out that something's wrong, and he says she knows out loud, causing Sims to ask him what he means. This is one more incident that we have to sort of put a pin in to see how things play out in the next season, because it's another reminder that Sims doesn't know everything that Bernard does yet.
She puts Holston's badge on his body, which confirms that him and his wife are actually there, that they died there. And then she stands up, which surprises everyone who's watching. By switching out the tape, Walker made it so that her suit protects her. Or at least bought her some more time, because she still only has that backpack of air, which hints that she doesn't have an indefinite amount of time to just go walking around. But she is able to make it to the top of the hill. At that point, we see Bernard running, and he goes to two doors that are marked as the server room. We see that the keychain that he had with the number 18 is flashing red again, and that the device is actually a key that opened this door. He opens them up, and in the reflection in his glasses, we see the lights come on. That shows us that this is a decent sized room, but we don't get to see what's inside there. The fact that they were out makes it look like it was unoccupied. This makes this one of the biggest mysteries to think about before next season. The flashing light and the fact that this is a wireless device are both things to take into consideration, but I have to leave the speculating for people who haven't read the books, since I already know where this is going. As Jules crests the hill, the fake display starts to break down. She sees that what's on the screens in the cafeteria is real, that the world is desolate, and she sees what looks like the remains of a destroyed city in the distance. She turns to take one last look at the sensor tower on top of their silo, and from those screens in the cafeteria, everyone sees her walk away. As she does that, and the camera pulls away, we see that there are several other craters just like the one she came from, which means there are other silos, and that they're relatively close, and it appears that there are a lot of them. If you think about the series of revelations she's had this season, it feels par for the course. What it means that they're not the only silo, and what she'll do next are questions that we'll have to wait for next season to get answers to. On top of that, I've got a million other questions, so I'll be following this up with a video about that in the next few days. Let me know what your big questions are in the comments. One thing I will say is that the books do an amazing job of answering the questions they ask you to think about. That's not to say there are no enduring mysteries. The author does seem to understand the value of leaving some things open to interpretation, but if you're worried that it feels like some of the different threads you were focused on are dropping away, I feel fairly certain that you'll see them pick back up on some of those in the future. To wrap everything up in case you missed something, their silo may not be and likely doesn't represent the last 10,000 people on Earth. Still, they've been put there and made to believe that by someone, aka the founders, for some reason, and possibly only Bernard knows why. The air is toxic outside and kills the people who go out to clean. IT fakes the display inside their helmets to encourage them to clean, and designs their suits to fail with bad tape so that they die before they get too far. The head of IT is a position that sees their role as crucial to the silo's survival and will go to any lengths to maintain order. They do this because they believe if people started to question their understanding of reality, it would lead to a catastrophic disaster. To go back to Plato in his cave, I should point out that it encourages you to think about what would happen in this situation and highlights the importance of questioning things and obtaining knowledge. It goes on to describe what happens when one of the prisoners escapes and experiences the world outside the cave, the inherent difficulty in accepting that the world outside even exists, and how it would be nearly impossible to go back and convince the others about what he saw. This shows that the process of learning how things really are is a difficult one, as it requires us to break free from our preconceived notions of reality and see the world as it truly is. So even though we don't know for sure what Jules will experience now that she's left the silo, she has challenged two of those preconceived notions of reality for the people she left behind. First, the belief that the people they send outside always clean. And second, she proved that it is possible to leave the silo when she walked out of sight. Walker knows this was made possible by changing out the faulty tape, and I'm guessing she won't keep that information to herself. And this is just an example of one person that was infected with her truth in this first season. I think of Billings crying in a room after he saw the guidebook. I think of the look on Sim's face after he heard Bernard say she knows. I think about Lucas down in the mines. I think about her father coming to bring her food after he lost so much at the hands of the silo. And it just keeps going from there. 
I also think about Bernard and the way he had his beliefs or his system of operations or whatever guides him validated by Jules ending up outside, and his talk about the founders and their wisdom. Her refusal to clean appears to challenge that, and her not dying doesn't look like an outcome he was prepared for. That should make a very interesting opening to season two, and I think that's a great place to leave things. I've also got an interview with Hugh Howey, author of the series, coming up, so make sure you check back for that. Please like this video if you enjoyed it, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already, and thanks for watching, I'll talk to you soon.